<clears throat> okay, hi again. Uh, this will be the lecture for week five in our course, English 410. So the lecture for uh, Tuesday, February 9th. Um, and in our work together this week, we're trying at least to conclude the unit of our course that we have under the heading of uh, Transmission and Transcendence. Um, we're talking about the early modern period of English literature as one that is uh, saturated, as I've said several times, with with the Bible um, to a degree, and in a way I would argue that uh, no time or place really ever has been before or since. Uh, and so we're trying to see what the literature of the period can tell us about the influence and the legacy of uh, the Christian holy book on um, thinking and expressing in uh, the period, especially with regard to what I would consider our issues, literary issues, uh, and that is to say, once again, uh, questions having to do with the whole category of language and its relationship to the world, and those are issues that I've grouped under a heading of phenomenology, and also the whole category of text, uh, and its major subfunctions, interpretation, understanding, and those are issues that I've grouped under the heading of uh, hermeneutics. We want, having done kind of some uh, basic legwork uh, over the last week about some of the uh, major and salient stories and ideas and uh, hermeneutic patterns of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, we want now, this week, uh, to carry our inquiry forward into a look at a highly relevant uh, selection of literary texts, poems, by uh, the great George Herbert, uh, whose dates were 1593 to 1633. Uh, I keep using this phrase, saturated with the Bible. Well, if the whole period is, nobody in the period is more saturated with the Bible than is uh, George Herbert, uh, absolutely dripping with it from uh, every pore. Uh, neither is anybody uh, more brilliant or more linguistically sensitive than uh, George Herbert. So his work uh, in, in his great book, um, uh, The Temple, uh, his work gives us um, not necessarily a unique, but a, certainly a, an irreproachable, let's say, um, opportunity to ask what it's like um, to have the Bible uh, on your mind uh, like that to the extent um, that Herbert does what it's like again in terms of those categories, those concerns that we have sketched out and that I've already uh, briefly reviewed. Um, now from the work that we have already done through our selection of, of, of passages from the Bible, we I think can sum up uh, the nature of the, the problems, the challenges that the biblical tradition presents um, along, I guess I'm going to say, three lines. Uh, the first would have to do uh, with uh, that term that is in the title of our current module. The, the, the term is transcendence. Uh, so as we have discussed, the uh, vision and conception of the divine, which is developed in the first two books of the Bible, and especially the second one, the book of Exodus, is one in which uh, God is um, infinitely beyond the world, uh, let's say. Um, there is an unbridgeable gap uh, between uh, the world and this unnameable, unknowable, unseeable uh, God. Um, 
and yet, at the same time, and in a sense precisely because there is uh, this gap, there's a desperate need and desire to find ways to, to bridge it, to overcome it. So uh, the transcendence of the divine in uh, the Old Testament tradition, that's one of the problems that I think the biblical legacy presents to somebody like George Herbert who wants to write uh, sacred poetry. Um, a second uh, difficult problematic aspect of uh, the biblical tradition, phenomenologically and uh, hermeneutically, uh, is that the biblical tradition tends to generate a great deal of, of, of paradoxical situations, just ideas that are incredibly difficult uh, to understand, and especially in the uh, relationship and transition from the Old to the New Testament. And we looked at a couple of really interesting and very, very challenging examples of that last week uh, when, for example, ideas from the Old Testament law are given uh, metaphorical or at least non-literal reinterpretations in the New Testament uh, context. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of the Romans 2 circumcision equals uncircumcision thing. Um, the notions that one has to take on in order to understand just the basic the theological uh, structure of Christianity are extremely difficult paradoxical notions. Uh, and that is a second uh, major and general aspect that I would highlight uh, as what comes out of uh, the intellectual influence and legacy of the Bible in the 17th century. And a third aspect uh, I want to highlight, which is kind of implicit in the first two, but we haven't really talked about it uh, as comprehensively yet as I think we uh, need to. It has to do with the question of, uh, of salvation, uh, getting saved. Uh, and uh, we need to recall, of course, a basic theological uh, point or perhaps I shouldn't say recall, we need to become aware of a basic theological point about uh, the Christian and indeed the biblical story, including Jewish story. From the very beginning, um, uh, the, the, the default position, so to speak, according to a traditional understanding of the Bible, is that uh, all of humanity is, is damned uh, from... Uh, if not quite the beginning of time, at least from Genesis 3, uh, the expulsion, the, 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 the sin and fall and expulsion from paradise is supposed to leave, according to the theological tradition, it's supposed to leave a kind of stain on all of us, and uh, so damnation is kind of the default. Um, we need to be saved. We need to be extracted uh, from uh, that default uh, and um, nothing, as it were, could be more important uh, than that. Uh, you need God to like you, uh, according to the traditions and the stories of the Bible, uh, because if he does not like you, if he is mad at you, he will do terrible things to you, uh, up to and including uh, damning you for all uh, eternity. Uh, and the question of salvation... Uh, is one, as we go through the Bible, and indeed through the history uh, of the Bible, uh, is one that becomes worse, not better, uh, let's say, along the following lines. Uh, in the Old Testament, and we just looked at a, at a very, very tiny selection of some relevant scriptures, uh, but in the Old Testament, in a sense, um, how you... Uh, Stay on God's good side, uh, so to speak, at least if you are one of the chosen people, the Jewish or Hebrew people. How to do that, in a sense, is fairly clear. You have to follow the law, uh, which is laid down, God's law, which is laid down in very great detail uh, from the book of Exodus through the book of Deuteronomy. Um, and insofar as you sin or break God's law, you need to atone for that. And there's a whole mechanism and system in the Old Testament centered on the tabernacle for how you atone for your sin. So even though that's really, really difficult, and as some of you guys will know, the Old Testament Israelites, in the whole story of the Exodus, they are, they are constantly getting it wrong and getting very severely punished by God for that. Even though it's very difficult, you in a sense know how to do it, Yeah. Uh, in a, I mean, in a, in a, in an intelligible way. Follow the law. Don't sin. If you do sin, atone, and that's 
that's the system. Okay, uh, it seems like something we can basically uh, understand. Uh, when Christianity comes along, uh, incorporates uh, the Jewish scriptures, adds on to them uh, the New Testament, that's the story of the stories of the life of Jesus of Nazareth, followed by a series of theological writings. When Christianity comes along, the status of the law becomes much less clear. Um, uh, we get all kinds of uh, paradoxical and, and, and slippery revisions of the meaning of the law, like the circumcision thing uh, that we saw in Romans chapter 2. Uh, radical reinterpretations of the Old Testament law in terms of its inner meaning. Uh, but as we discussed last week, even though that's hermeneutically a very, very powerful move, it's also one which seems a little bit difficult to control and, 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 and a little bit difficult to understand fundamentally, just in terms of its basic validity, that interpretation of the law in terms of its spirit rather than uh, its letter. In general, and in the with it, it, painting with our very broadest brush, in general, uh, Christianity is supposed to bring a comprehensive reinterpretation of the Jewish law, the Old Testament law, according to which uh, that meaning of the law, which in the Old Testament appeared to be both literal and very diverse, so it's a whole bunch of different laws about all kinds of different things, in the Old Testament. Uh, in the New Testament reinterpretation, uh, the meaning of the law becomes non-literal, so it's not evident on the surface, and it actually becomes, in a sense, unitary. There's always one meaning of the law according to this radical Christian reinterpretation of it, and the meaning of the law is love. So, um, I gave you guys uh, on the Canvas page a link to a, a, a very strange uh, text by John Milton in the 17th century. It's a book he wrote on divorce. It's called The Doctrine and Discipline of Divorce. And I added it to our Canvas page, not because I want to talk about that issue, but because the, the section that I asked you to read has, has Milton ringingly stating this, uh, this intensely Christian view that love is the fulfilling of every commandment. Love is the fulfilling of every commandment. Uh, and that's not just Milton, that's, that, that's Milton expressing what is a kind of orthodox, uh, early modern uh, Christian interpretation of, uh, of how Christians are to relate to uh, the Old Testament law. Overall, of course, it's much, much more, much more complicated than that. Nonetheless, the point for our purposes is there is at least foundational to the Christian reinterpretation of Judaism. A, a, a radical reinterpretation of the Old Testament law in, in, in terms of an inner meaning, a, a spiritual meaning, a non-literal meaning, which is always the same. Love, 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 love. So supposedly that's what God means when he's giving all those commandments uh, in Exodus 20, when he's, when he's giving further laws and, uh, and uh, directions throughout Exodus, Levit Leviticus numbers, etc. Uh, and that sounds great. So, okay, the meaning of the law is love. Uh, wonderful. Um, but it's a little bit hard to understand, right? Uh, or a little bit hard to validate. Um, how, can, how can that really be uh, the meaning of every Old Testament law? Uh, how can that be the meaning of every scripture? Uh, which is something that the great uh, St. Augustine, the founder of Roman Catholicism, says, for example. Uh, if you're ever concerned about what a given Bible story means, Augustine says, tell you what, it always means love. And if you can arrive at an interpretation which is consistent with the law of love, you're right every time. Sounds pretty good. Also sounds a little bit difficult to validate. So that's, that's what I mean by uh, the, the whole question of how we stay on God's good side. Question of salvation. That question gets more difficult to understand as we go through the history of uh, the Bible uh, rather than easier to understand. And one more point on this before we turn to our texts uh, from Herbert, uh, and, and this has to do with uh, the history of Christianity in the early modern period itself. We have to tell a little story, uh, well, story is perhaps the wrong word, we have to sketch a little bit of the history of the Protestant Reformation 
uh, beginning in the 16th century. And the account that we have to give very, very um, quickly goes like this. In medieval Catholicism, there is, again, a highly coherent theory, an intelligible theory, for how you stay on God's good side, how you can be saved. And this highly intelligible theory is known as the theology of works. Works just means doing good stuff, okay? Uh, everything from praying a lot to helping little old ladies across the street to giving money to the church. We like that one. These are works, and uh, good works are supposed to lead to a good outcome for you after death. They're supposed to help you get into heaven, spend less time in purgatory, and so on. Uh, that was the medieval Catholic idea. One really, really big thing that happened uh, in the Protestant Reformation is that the major reformers, Luther, Calvin, and so on, they looked at that medieval Catholic doctrine of works, the theology of works, and they raised some really powerful objections to it. Uh, one of which was that 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 medieval Catholic doctrine was very much open to corruption, and certainly by the Reformation period, it had become a source of horrendous corruption. Uh, the whole practice of of the church selling indulgences, for example, whereby uh, if you can, if you have the money, you can actually buy your way out of purgatory, uh, and so on and so forth. So it, it had become a site of horrendous corruption. But even more importantly than that, uh, for the Protestant reformers. The doctrine of works appeared to be theologically uh, turpid or, um, you know, murky, uh, unacceptable. Because the, theolo the theology of works, they argued, seemed to suggest, and we can put this in a slightly technical way, okay? It seemed to suggest that the human will could have an effect on the divine will, Okay. Uh, and to put that less technically, the theology of works seemed to suggest that you could persuade God to save you. Now, persuading is a changing of the mind, right? Uh, so it was as though uh, God might have decided, for example, based on your conduct from the time you were a little baby to the time that you're 52, uh, God might have decided, no way, that, that's not my guy. Um, too much bad behavior, going to hell. Then you come along and suddenly, like you're helping little old ladies across the street like crazy and giving tons of money to the church and, and uh, who knows, uh, founding charities or whatever. And God says, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Uh, you know, that guy turned out to be a pretty good guy for all. Well, that, the, the reformer said that's ridiculous. You can't change God's mind. You can't persuade God. Uh, the, the human will can't have an effect on the divine will. So what they proposed instead was what is known in Protestantism, and we'll wrap up this little theological survey very quickly. It's known as the theology of grace. Uh, and the theology of grace has the advantage of, I think, uh, logic, it makes a lot of sense in terms of thinking about the nature of a, a divine, omnipotent, omniscient being. Uh, it has the disadvantage of being very, very difficult to make sense of, especially moral sense. The theology of grace says, look, the only way we can really understand who gets saved and who gets damned is if we just accept that God decided from before the beginning of time who was going to get saved and who was going to be damned. That's called predestination. It's all decided uh, from the beginning. Uh, and in at, at least the most intense versions of this doctrine, which we find uh, in uh, early modern Calvinism, which is the form of Protestantism that uh, is basic to uh, George Herbert and to uh, early modern English literary culture. Uh, in the most intense versions of this doctrine, they say, look, God didn't even decide to save or damn you because he saw you were going to be a good person or a bad person. No, he just decided. And uh, you cannot possibly know or understand or question uh, that decision that uh, he uh, made. 
Uh, so, uh, as I said, that question of salvation, of, of how uh, to make God like you, it gets harder to understand as we go through the story of the Bible and the story of uh, Christianity. Uh, by the time we come to George Herbert's world, it seems that there isn't really any way to make God like you if he uh, doesn't. That kind of um, resolution with God, um, uh, doing what you can uh, to make him relieve your sufferings and to make him save you after death so that you go to heaven and enjoy eternal life. Um, that is, if you like, and even if you don't, uh, for Herbert uh, and for somebody like Herbert, that is the most urgent, important communication in which you could possibly engage, right? Because it's a question not only of, of, of your suffering in this life, but also of your suffering or, or, or lack of suffering. Uh, for all eternity. It is uniquely important, and yet it seems impossible. Uh, because, strictly speaking, there's nothing you can do uh, in early modern Protestantism to change the way God feels about you. And the way he feels about you, that's just his free and, as it were, arbitrary choice. Okay? Very, very difficult uh, historical stuff that we can talk about uh, more on Thursday for the moment as we move forward uh, to Herbert. Let's just note uh, that that is the kind of summary sketch of um, what the issues are. Um, okay, um, I want to go on now and look at a selection of our selection of uh, Herbert, Herbert's poems. And um, we saw last week that Herbert's The Temple is arranged in accordance with this uh, really amazing structural conceit such that when you're entering, when you're opening the book, it's like you're walking into uh, a country church. You go, you go across the church porch, across the threshold. You're sprinkled with holy water, and the first thing you see is that altar. So we, we begin the temple with that elaborate structural metaphor I mentioned it again here because um, it, it is quite striking that even though that, that structural metaphor for, the, for, for Herbert's book seems very important at the beginning, he does not actually continue that. Um, uh, we don't find ourselves going through the book where such that Herbert's like, okay, now we're at the vestry, now we're... Uh, you know, at the at, at at the washrooms or whatever. No, uh, that, that, that he moves away from that, and and I mention it that because I want actually to move away from it and 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 actually move around within Herbert's book quite freely in order to try to make as much sense of it as as we can. Um, and in fact, I want to begin. Uh, on page 77 of our wonderful facsimile uh, with a poem of uh, Herbert's called Vanity, okay? And again, in these YouTube lectures, I'm not able to really uh, share the text with you very effectively, so I have to ask you guys to open up and follow along. We will work with the text in more detail together on Thursday, but yes, I want to begin uh, on page 77 of the Temple with Herbert's poem, uh, Vanity, um, uh, which I'm going to preface uh, as follows. We, we began this course a number of weeks ago now talking about the way in which, uh, well, we were talking about the uh, late 17th century slash early 18th century moment where we're getting the emergence of something like modern natural science. We're getting the emergence of... Um, uh, modern ideas of information, perhaps, of, 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 of the automation of knowledge, all that uh, fascinating stuff in Wilkins and Leibniz. Uh, and I was making the point that that stuff um, is not sort of over against a Christian context. It actually emerges in a fascinating way from a, a, a Christian context, a biblical uh, context. So there are, uh, and I'll come back to this point at the very end of this lecture, there are some really interesting lines that we can draw between 
uh, the, the world of the Bible in the 17th century and the world of emergent natural science, information technology, uh, and so on. Um, however, we do not find that in Herbert, I think. I, I, I want to say that very clearly and from uh, the get-go. Um, so uh, I, I've used this facetious phrase several times, this is your mind on Bible. So George Herbert is your early modern English literature on Bible. What does that mean? How does that work? Well, in Herbert, it certainly does not mean or, or seem to entail a focus on or interest in anything like natural philosophy or um, scientific understanding of the natural world. Uh, Herbert does uh, engage in a number of his poems in a, in a kind of persistent fantasy of wishing he could become part of nature himself. So he has this persistent idea that comes up in another of poems where he'll, he'll say, oh, life sucks uh, and being a priest is so hard. I wish I were a tree, uh, Herbert says in a number of poems. Then at least I'd be good for something. You know, birds would come and nest in me uh, and so on. So Herbert loves, I think, a fantasy of becoming an item of the natural world himself. Um, but it's always kind of in passing, and it's, it's precisely a fantasy of ceasing to be a thinking, feeling, moral human being, because that stuff is just so hard. Um, as a thinking being, as a feeling being, Herbert uh, is not concerned very much with the created world, but with the holy word. He's concerned uh, with the state of his soul. He's concerned with how to worship God. He's concerned with the question of salvation. And we can uh, pick that point up then from this uh, rather beautiful poem, well, very beautiful poem, uh, Vanity, um, where Herbert writes, the fleet astronomer can bore and thread the spheres with his quick piercing mind. He views their stations, walks from door to door, surveys as if he had designed to make a purchase there. He sees their dances and knoweth long before both their full-eyed aspects and secret glances. The nimble diver with his side cuts through the working waves that he may fetch his dearly earned pearl, which God did hide on purpose from the venturous wretch, that he might save his life and also hers, who with excessive pride her own destruction and his danger wears. The subtle chemic, chemist, uh, or alchemist uh, would be probably close to what uh, Herbert means there. The subtle chemic can divest and strip the creature naked till he find the callow principles within their nest. There he imparts to them his mind, admitted to their bedchamber before they appear trim and dressed to ordinary suitors at the door. What hath not man sought out and found but his dear God, who yet his glorious law embosoms in us, mellowing the ground with showers and frosts, with love and awe, so that we need not say, where's this command? Poor man, thou searchest round to find out death, but missest life at hand. Herbert's poems often end with that kind of exceptionally satisfying, ringing, rounded sense of a, a conclusion. So in Vanity, uh, we have Herbert surveying three kinds of worldly activity, stargazing, pearl diving, and chemistry or alchemy, so the analyzing of substances. And they are all, interestingly, what I think we can call modes of discovery, so penetrating or going beyond uh, appearances to see into the hidden nature of things. Uh, but for Herbert, uh, in this poem, that's just basically a waste of time. That's just looking for death. Life is at hand. So we end this poem, uh, Herbert's Vanity, with a kind of with a kind of Sunday schooly advice, which is a thing that happens frequently in Herbert. Uh, you know, don't waste your time with that stuff. Just look around. Uh, uh, God's command is evident just if you kind of go uh, for a nature walk. Um, so, um, what is Herbert's mind on Bible like? What is the effect of that? Well, it, it certainly does not interest him 
uh, in any kind of inquiry into the natural world. And I would go farther and say it, it doesn't even really interest him in the natural world or in the world at all. Uh, what matters to Herbert is the Word. What matters is, is the Bible, is the Christian Testament. And uh, on that, I want to uh, go back uh, in our text all the way to page 29. We're going to look back at a poem of Herbert's called The Agony. Okay. Just give me one sec. Click, 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 click. Page 29, The Agony. Uh, and you see what I mean about my kind of bopping around freely inside the temple. Vanity and The Agony, uh, I think, are quite closely related poems, but they are uh, certainly not associated uh, in, in in the book. So I'm not sure how much work the actual sequence of, of Herbert's poems uh, does here. So the agony on page 29 of the temple, Herbert says, Philosophers have measured mountains, fathomed the depths of seas of states and kings, walked with a staff to heaven and traced fountains. But there are two vast, spacious things the which to measure it doth more behoove, yet few there are that sound them, sin and love. Who would know sin, let him repair unto Mount Olivet, Mount Olivet, the site of the crucifixion of Christ. Let him repair unto Mount Olivet. There shall he see a man so wrung with pains that all his hair, his skin, his garments bloody be. Sin is that press and vice which forceth pain to hunt his cruel food through every vein. Who knows not love, let him assay and taste that juice which on the cross a pike did set again a brooch. Then let him say if ever he did taste the like. Love is that liquor sweet and most divine which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. That incredible uh, concluding couplet. Love is that liquor sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. Uh, you know, George Herbert, along with John Donne and the somewhat later Andrew Marvell, they're the three greats of 17th century English poetry, whom we usually group together under the heading of so-called metaphysical poetry, which means uh, uh, poetry of uh, complex thoughts, tortuous logic, and above all, a poetry of paradoxical conceits. That's metaphysical poetry. The identity of blood and wine clearly is one of those paradoxical conceits, and the incredibly beautiful uh, rhyme although very simple rhyme, that Herbert is able to lay on us at the end of his poem, The Agony, a kind of kind of makes that conceit go down easy. Uh, love is that liquor sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. Now we recognize, I hope, based on the work that we did last week with the Last Supper scene of Matthew 26, uh, that Herbert is invoking here the, the central Christian concept and, and, and procedure of the Eucharist or communion, the idea uh, that, uh, that, that Christ sacrifices, and of course literally sacrifices, his body, his blood, in order to pay the debt of human sin. And this, is, uh, this sacrifice is... Uh, is represented and, as it were, reenacted uh, in almost all Christian denominations through the procedure of the communion at the height of the Christian mass or service. And it's in the Last Supper uh, that, that Christ himself kind of lays down that symbolic slash mystical procedure when he breaks bread and gives it to his disciples, says, this is my body. When he pours out wine, says, this is my blood. Um, and we talked last week about the extraordinary, even though kind of um, dreadfully obvious and, and yet and yet extraordinarily strange intervention of uh, the the metaphorical that occurs there in Matthew twenty six and other scriptures like it, and becomes normative to uh, inseparable from uh, Christian hermeneutics uh, from that point on. Uh, Herbert is obviously invoking uh, that symbolism, that doctrine, uh, 
that idea at the end of the agony. Uh, but he's actually, if we go back to that previous stanza, he, he's invoking it via another scripture, which we didn't look at. Uh, it's from the Gospel of John. Excuse me. It's from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 19. At least I don't think I add. Well, we didn't look at it together. Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 19, which is a moment in the story of the crucifixion uh, when um, uh, Jesus has, has died on the cross and uh, Roman soldiers come along and uh, stick a spear uh, in his side. Blood and water uh, flows out, and that is supposed to be, again, a symbolic representation or prefiguration of uh, the Eucharist. And it's very gory, right? Um, that blood uh, gushing out. Um, when we talk about metaphors uh, in the literary business, like the metaphor of the communion wine being the blood of Christ, um, when we talk about metaphors, uh, it is conventional for us to distinguish between what we call the vehicle and the tenor of uh, the metaphor. Um, the, the tenor of the metaphor is what it actually means, okay? Uh, so, uh, the, 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 the vehicle of the metaphor is, is what allows it to mean that. So, blood gushing out of the side of the crucified Christ in John chapter 19, that, that's a vehicle. Uh, uh, its tenor, its meaning, is the Eucharist, the communion, the, the opportunity for, for believers to attain salvation through participation in the life of the church. Uh, what Herbert does uh, at the end of the agony, I think, is really quite remarkable, uh, which is that he sticks our noses in the vehicle, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, you know, if we go back to Matthew 26, when Christ is pouring out that wine, he's saying, this is my blood. We're like, well, no, that's not your blood. That, that, that's wine. But we understand that you mean that's your sacrifice for us and therefore the opportunity of salvation. Herbert makes us look at that blood, makes us look at that gore covering the crucified Christ and gushing out of uh, his side in John chapter 19. And those incredible lines at the end of the agony, love is that liquor sweet and most divine which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. Yum. Uh, these incredible, beautiful, ringing lines, they're as it were trying to make us like that idea. Uh, trying to make that gory notion which lurks inside the central Christian ceremony, the notion of drinking Christ's blood. They're trying to make that gory notion palpable, uh, intelligible, lovable, uh, and so I guess the question that arises uh, out of a poem like this one, is that even doable? Uh, is that what George Herbert wants us to kind of get or settle on, loving the idea of drinking Christ's blood, that sweet, sweet wine? Uh, or does he rather want us to grasp that that's ungraspable, uh, to see that we can't ever really love that? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, what I think I am sure about is that Herbert, in a poem like this one, and many, many others, Her Herbert is a poet, a poet of struggle, um, saturated with the Bible, as I have said many, many, many times now, obsessed with it, uh, directed and driven and guided by it, and yet not really understanding what that means or, or, or where that goes what is it to be obsessed with the Bible? Well, Herbert himself is trying to figure that out. Um, and I guess it's worth pausing there and, 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 and noting uh, well, a couple of things. Uh, but uh, one of them, and the simplest one would be, um, Her Herbert, you know, sometimes he's Sunday schooly, And those of us who do not, do not have Sunday school dispositions that may not really work for us. 
sometimes Herbert is Sunday schooly. For my money, nobody does Sunday school better than George Herbert. I mean, I think if George, if George Herbert had been my Sunday school teacher, I might have lasted longer. Let me put it that way. Uh, but George Herbert is not a poet of kind of, you know, Christianity tra-la-la. Uh, and in part, this has to do with the way in which Christianity is understood in the 17th century. It is not, uh, you know, this kind of evangelical lifting up of lifting up of hands thing that we have in a lot of uh, denominations today. No, uh, Herbert is a poet of, of agony, uh, of suffering, of doubt, uh, of despair. Uh, and and it is precisely the Bible that is doing that to him. So he's trying to figure out, again, where that goes, what its outcome is, how he can understand. Uh, that's critical. Um, now, one thing for sure, uh, Her Herbert is very clear about just how difficult it is even to understand the Bible itself as a text. And uh, accordingly, he actually, for those of us who consider ourselves students of the history of culture, so this has nothing to do with, you know, faith or anything like that. For those of us who think of ourselves as students of the history of culture, Herbert is a very, very useful writer because uh, he helps us to understand how difficult it is to understand uh, the Bible, how paradoxical and mercurial its theological and other hermeneutic uh, structures are, especially uh, when we think in terms of the relationship between the Old Testament, so again, the Jewish scriptures, and the New Testament, the specifically Christian part of the Christian Bible, which basically consists in a radical reinterpretation of the Jewish scriptures. I mean, as radical as it possibly uh, could be. Um, and that creates all kinds of interpretative problems. Uh, and, and on that note, I want to turn to another poem now. We're going to go all the way up to page, excuse me, page 120 uh, in the temple and look at Herbert's poem, The Bunch of Grapes. Okay. Uh, in which he begins by talking to joy, um, something that Herbert, throughout the temple, kind of keeps finding and losing. He says, Joy, I did lock thee up, but some bad man hath let thee out again. And now, methinks, I am where I began seven years ago. One vogue and vain, one air of thoughts usurps my brain. I did toward Canaan draw, but now I am brought back to the Red Sea, the sea of shame. Again, Herbert, not a poet of tra-la-la, -la, a, a poet of doubt, a poet of despair. Uh, he, he certainly considers himself a, a devout Christian. I mean, he, he's, a, he's a priest. Uh, that's his vocation. That's his calling. But it isn't easy. It's as hard as hell. Uh, and uh, he keeps falling back, as it were, into depression and despair and self-doubt, imposter syndrome, maybe uh, we could call it. And this poem, The Bunch of Grapes, begins uh, with his falling back into one of those kinds of uh, emotional states. Uh, and uh, what we want to notice and what we then can work with is the metaphor uh, that uh, Herbert reaches for in order to talk about uh, the despair that he feels and the progress that he keeps trying to make. The metaphor, as some of you guys will probably pick up very quickly, others uh, not, and that's fine, that's just based on the difference in our various backgrounds and familiarity with this stuff. Uh, the metaphor that Herbert reaches for is, of course, from the Old Testament. It's the metaphor of the, the journey undertaken by the Israelites, the Jewish or Hebrew people, after their escape from Egypt uh, in Exodus, toward what's called the promised land, the land of Canaan. Uh, and this story of the Israelites' journey is the story, if you like, of the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and uh, Deuteronomy. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, uh, in the Christian reinterpretation of uh, the uh, Jewish Bible, um, 
that journey of the Israelites from Egypt to Canaan is, is, is read very frequently or typically allegorically. It is uh, an historical fact, so to speak, they would, they would think. Uh, they, they would certainly literally believe that there was an exodus and, that, and, and the Jewish people uh, underwent that 40-year wandering in the desert before entering the Promised Land, etc. But they would also uh, see that story as offering itself through an allegorical or spiritual meaning. It's about the journey of the soul. It's about the journey of the soul towards salvation and the entry into Canaan then, uh, the entry into the promised land is understood as the entry into heaven and into uh, eternal life. So that's the metaphor uh, Herbert reaches for. God, I was doing so well, now I'm right back at the beginning. I'm right back at the Red Sea uh, where the Israelites um, were uh, in Exodus 14, as you may recall. Uh, just at that early point of the escape from Egypt. And I guess on that point, it's left completely ambiguous in this first stanza of Herbert's The Bunch of Grapes, whether when he says, I'm back at the Red Sea, does he mean, I'm back at the Red Sea just after they crossed it, or am I back at the Red Sea just before they crossed it, looking at uh, that expanse of water and hearing uh, Pharaoh's horsemen thundering up behind. In any case, uh, as we go through the poem, Herbert develops this metaphor. Uh, he says, For as the Jews of old by God's command traveled and saw no town, so now each Christian hath his journey spanned. Their story, that is to say the story of the Old Testament Israelites, their story pens and sets us down. A single deed is small renown. God's works are wide and led in future times. His ancient justice overflows our crimes. Then have we too our guardian fires and clouds. So these are other elements of uh, the story of the Exodus in which God is supposed to have led the Israelites in a pillar of, of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Uh, our scripture dew drops fast. So here Herbert is invoking the story of the manna, the miraculous food, which drops from heaven to feed the Israelites during their 40 years in the desert. And Herbert's saying, well, so, yeah, we have, <clears throat> we, we have guardian fires and clouds. You know, we've got um, comets, maybe. Um, meaningful clouds uh, in, in the sky. Uh, we've got scripture dew. Okay, we don't have manna. But the scripture falls on us like dew, or the scripture falls on us with the dew. It gives us heavenly food. That's the idea. Our scripture dew drops fast. We have our sands and serpents, tents and shrouds. Alas, our murmurings come not last. But where's the cluster? Where's the taste of mine inheritance? Lord, if I must borrow, let me as well take up their joy as sorrow. I said a few moments ago that Herbert... Uh, is not a tra-la-la kind of Christian poet. He is Sunday schooly some of the time. Uh, and this is one of those times when Herbert gets Sunday schooly, um, I actually think that we want to kind of prick up our ears and listen very, very carefully uh, because because uh, uh, he's going somewhere non-Sunday schooly, uh, let's say, uh, when that happens uh, in his work. Um and what's happening here in this third stanza of The Bunch of Grapes, and this is very, very difficult, you guys, that's for sure. Uh, Herbert, he's done this little kind of, again, Sunday schooly survey of the story of the Exodus and says, well, this works out very well. My spiritual journey as a Christian maps very nicely onto this Old Testament story, and I can, I can point to all kinds of things that have their equivalents uh, in uh, the story of the Exodus. He brings that whole kind of Sunday schooly bit up to actually another specific scripture, which he's invoking here, when he says, uh, where's the cluster, where's the taste of mine inheritance? Uh, Herbert is here invoking a specific scripture from the book of Numbers. It is uh, the book of Numbers chapter 13, uh, in which what happens is the Israelites have come up to the very border of the promised land, and they send scouts into the country. Moses and Aaron send scouts into the country to, to see what it's like. Uh, and among other things, the, the scouts come back with this bunch of grapes uh, that they have cut down in the promised land. Um, Herbert's saying, where's the cluster? Where's the taste? I I invoking uh, this 
moment in the book of Numbers. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, it means, okay, I guess, when do I get there? You know, where is the taste of mine inheritance? The Israelites got to enter the promised land. Why don't I? Where's the cluster? Where's the taste of mine inheritance? Lord, if I must borrow, let me as well take up their joy as sorrow. But can he want the grape who hath the wine? I have their, I have their fruit and more. Blessed be God, who prospered Noah's vine and made it bring forth grapes good store. But much more him I must adore, who of the law's sour juice sweet wine did make. Even God himself being pressed for my sake. Very difficult uh, concluding paragraph in which Herbert's doing a couple things that we need to note and try to grapple with. He's asked this rhetorical question in the previous stanza, where's, my, where, where's the taste of my inheritance? Then he says, oh, but can he want the grape who hath the wine? I've got the wine, he says. Um, you know, grapes make wine, right? So if I've got the wine, I've already got the grapes. I've got the wine, he means, in the sense that I already have Christianity. I have the Bible. That's the wine. Uh, so all of those, all of that Old Testament stuff, that all got, that all got uh, reduced, as it were, into the New Testament. That's what I have. Uh, so I should be happy. Um, <clears throat> uh, Blessed be God who prospered Noah's vine and made it bring forth grapes, good store. These grapes uh, kind of haunt Herbert's imagination. Uh, and, and the mention of Noah is a, a bit of an odd note, an off note here, uh, maybe, because Herbert's invoking another uh, Old Testament story from much, much earlier in the Bible, way back in Genesis, after the flood, uh, when there's a little episode where Noah grows grapes, he gets drunk, some of his sons <laughs> come in and see him naked while he's drunk, uh, and uh, they're damned for all time, basically. So, um, we have Herbert, what's happening here? We have Herbert uh, trying to make sense of his despair as a Christian, trying to make sense of what it is to be obsessed with the Bible, trying to work it out through a series of Old Testament metaphors which don't quite seem to be leading to the satisfaction or the relief uh, that he wants. Um, uh, he ends with this, Blessed be God who prospered Noah's store and made it bring forth grapes good, excuse me, who pros prospered Noah's vine and made it bring forth grapes good store. Uh, and you're like, gosh, why are, you, why are you mentioning Noah here? That story didn't turn out well at all when Noah grew those grapes and made wine and get, got drunk. Uh, and almost in response, Herbert quickly changes course and says, But much more him I must adore, Jesus. But much more him I must adore, who of the law's sour juice sweet wine did make. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pause on that line. Him who of the law's sour juice sweet wine did make. Uh, the fundamental Christian idea uh, that Herbert is invoking here is that when the Jewish law enters Christianity or gives way to Christianity, it becomes totally different and totally the same. Okay? Uh, and for us to work that up completely would just be work that we don't want to do. Um, but it is uh, the same idea as one that I was referring to earlier, that in Christianity, the, the Old Testament law doesn't go away. It's just that it's... And it's not given a new meaning either. It's rather the case that it's real and true meaning. The meaning that was always there all along is revealed and made apparent. And the meaning that was there all along was love. Uh, so when God was saying, thou shalt not kill, that meant love. When he was saying, don't covet your neighbor's wife, that meant love. Uh, when he was giving directions for the building of the tabernacle, that meant love and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> The sour juice of the law becomes the sweet wine of love. That's the 
almost cliche Christian idea uh, that Herbert is settling on uh, in this poem. Do you see what I mean? Settling on as kind of his relief, his hope, the way to make himself feel better. Oh yeah, the, the law's sour juice was made sweet wine for my sake. Um, which sounds pretty good, but also maybe pretty hard to understand. Um, do we really buy that idea that the meaning of every law all along was actually love? Does that make as much sense as we need it to make, as Herbert needs it uh, to make? Uh, and uh, we're not done with this poem uh, because, again, as uh, in uh, his poem, The Agony, which we looked at a few minutes ago, Herbert draws us back to the blood, draws us back to the gore. Uh, much more of the Christian story. I mean, the story uh, that depends on that scene of the crucifixion. Um, much more him I must adore, who of the law sour juice sweet wine did make. And I was like, ah, you're right, that's really nice. He made the sour juice into sweet wine. Much more him I must adore, who of the law's sour juice sweet wine did make, even God himself being pressed for my sake. This poem in which the first word is joy, uh, a poem in which Herbert uh, is seeking to journey from the Red Sea of depression to the joy of belief and salvation and full participation in the faith, its end point is not uh, those grapes, not even drunken Noah, it's not even the idea of sweet wine, excuse me, sour juice becoming sweet wine. The end point where we get to is an image of Jesus in the wine press getting crushed and that blood uh, seeping out. Um, that's joy, supposedly. And it's like this poem is saying, okay, if you're trying to make sense of your head full of the Bible, if you're not feeling the joy that you feel like you ought to feel, uh, just think about Jesus getting crushed to death. Oh, okay. But I, I, I don't actually believe that that image makes even George Herbert feel joyous. So what we have so far with our work on George Herbert is uh, he is giving us, again, not a kind of um, Sunday school entry into Christianity. Um, and even though George Herbert's poetry is incredibly brilliant, incredibly sophisticated, and often incredibly beautiful, uh, that's not the point either. What, what, what Herbert is giving us is a, 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 a picture, a tour, maybe we could say even, of just how difficult it is to be obsessed with the Bible uh, in English literature in the 17th century, how hard it is uh, for your mind to be full of the Bible, saturated with the Bible. Perhaps it's at its very worst uh, it, it, from a rigorously Christian, which is to say New Testament uh, perspective, and perhaps it's at its worst this Bible mind experience, perhaps it's at its worst under conditions of Protestantism. And that's again because of that uh, revised idea that you have uh, in Protestantism of, of what salvation actually looks like, how it actually uh, occurs. It doesn't occur through works, it occurs uh, through grace. Uh, ultimately, it becomes a, 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 an idea of something God decided at the beginning of time, or sometimes people will say before the beginning of time, just to make it seem really scary. Um, and uh, in the harshest forms of this doctrine, you are, you are also supposed explicitly to accept what's called double predestination, which means it is not just the idea 
that God decided who was going to be saved and kind of forgot about the other people. It is rather the idea that God explicitly decided who was going to be saved and explicitly decided who was going to be damned. Uh, and that duly comes to pass. A very, very difficult doctrine uh, to feel uh, very good uh, or uh, joyous about. And um, I want to look at a poem with you on that, but in my notes here, I have neglected to put the page number down, so forgive me for scrabbling for a moment. The poem is called The Water Course, and yes, we will find it on page 165 of our wonderful facsimile of uh, the temple. Sorry. Okay. The water course. Oh, excuse me, it's on page 164, just at the bottom. How hard is it to be an early modern Protestant, given all the stuff that we have been sketching out in this lecture? How hard is it to uh, feel that joy um, that Herbert talks about and seems to want? How hard is it to make it make sense? Our kind of sense, I mean. Well, it's approximately as hard as this. In the water course, Herbert addresses his fellow human creatures, his fellow Christians and sinners, saying to them, Thou who dost dwell and linger here below, since the condition of this world is frail, Whereof all plants affliction soonest grow, if troubles overtake thee, do not wail. For who can look for less that loveth life? Or for who can look for less that loveth strife? But rather turn the pipe and water's course to serve thy sins and furnish thee with store of sovereign tears, springing from true remorse, that so in pureness thou mayst him adore. Who gives to man as he sees fit salvation? Who gives to, to man as he sees fit damnation? Uh, how hard is it? How can you make it make sense? Uh, Pro, uh, Herbert asks, and the answer is, well, all you got to do is see uh, that life is the same as strife. And as far as you can possibly know, Salvation is the same as damnation. Or perhaps to put that a little bit differently, that reading, if we, if we focus on that, that image and that symbol that uh, Herbert uses, the symbol of the water course, so the water pipe. Um, feeling sad? Just turn the pipe. You know, feeling sad because you're worried about salvation, uh, because your life is full of strife, your life is strife, just turn the pipe uh, and recognize that what comes out of that pipe for you is tears. Uh, and where those tears lead is toward damnation. And, you know, just go with that and accept it. Easy, right? Well, no, of course not. And for us, including for Herbert, that cannot possibly make sense. We cannot possibly, well, even if we accept that idea that we may be damned, there's nothing we can do about it other than, you know, cry appropriately and say to ourselves, well, I guess that's my lot in life. Despair. Even if we attempt to accept that, uh, we can never actually understand that. We can never uh, grasp that. Uh, inwardly. Uh, so what emerges, I think, uh, at this point from our work on Herbert uh, is that, you know, even though he, he can be very Sunday schooly, and even though he maps out, as it were, a radical version of, of a doctrine of patience uh, uh, under early modern Protestantism, you've just got to accept uh, whatever God has in store for you. That is really not 
where Herbert stops or um, it's more like where Herbert starts, uh, let's see. There is a need for understanding uh, in Herbert. Uh, and at the deepest level, and at his very best, Herbert is deploying all of his brilliance and his creativity to bring himself and us to moments where uh, these matters of theology and salvation that don't seem to make any sense at all, moments at least where perhaps we glimpse a way uh, in which they can make sense. Um, and, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, the concrete poems um, Uh, and uh, sorry for my uh, hesitating because um, <clears throat> I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm going on a bit too long uh, here. Um, <clears throat> let me cut to the chase a little bit by just identifying some work that we can do together on Thursday. And then I actually want to go to a, a couple of late poems where I think Herbert... Um, does as well as he ever does uh, to try to make uh, these impossible questions of theology and salvation make some kind of sense. He tries to make his mind, his Bible mind, hold together and cohere and be a place where he can live and we can live. Um, but a couple of, uh, of issues just before we get there. The, the concrete poems. Uh, let me just lay something further on the table that we can talk about more on Thursday. As we said last week, you, you come to those concrete poems and, and it looks like you know how they work. It turns out you don't. Uh, the altar, for example, does not actually fit up. The, the, the form, I mean, of that poem does not simply repeat or underline the, so to speak, content of the words. No, there's, if any, there's a discontinuity uh, between uh, those two. I'd like to talk about that some more on Thursday. The other example, of course, and it's a really spectacular example, is Herbert's poem, Easter Wings. We touched on that very briefly at the end of our time together uh, last Thursday. Um, again, I would suggest to you guys that there's a, there's a, a profound disconnect between the meaning of the words of Easter Wings uh, and the, the concrete form of the poems. There's even a disconnect between the concrete form of those, of those poems and the fact of there being poems in a book, if you see what I mean. Because in order to read the poems, you actually have to turn the book the wrong way. And the stanzas seem to be arranged in the wrong order. So it's like, it's like the concreteness of those poems uh, is, uh, on the one hand or in the first place, it's like Herbert's attempt to take things to another level. So words aren't working. Uh, they're not getting me to the understanding that I want. They're not getting me to the communication with God that I want. I've got to do something more radical. I've got to create these visual artifacts. Uh, and yet they don't work because they actually, they, they, they break the book, if you like. Um, in order to see the form of Easter wings, you can't read the words. If you read the words of Easter Wings, you can't see the form because you have to turn the book the wrong way. So uh, let's talk about that some more on Thursday. The, the brief point for the moment would be, uh, and, and we can, we can uh, make it this way, uh, those concrete poems are a very, very striking element, of course, for anybody who comes to read uh, George Herbert's work. But they are also an exceedingly limited uh, aspect of the uh, of that work. It's really only two poems, the altar and and Easter wings, that have that strong concrete element. So if we think of Herbert as more or less desperately reaching for strategies that will allow him to understand his Bible mind, uh, that concrete element that's a failed strategy. You know, it's on the table and, and he moves on. That is not the answer that he's looking for. Uh, and it matters, I think, to that point as well, that both of those poems come along relatively early uh, in the temple. Uh, and then a second point that I just want to put on the table uh, in hopes that we can discuss it uh, more on Thursday. Um <clears throat> There's a great deal of concern in Herbert about how 
you should express yourself how you should write your religious, your Protestant poetry. Uh, and um, in terms of our selections, the two really, really fascinating and very, very beautiful poems uh, for this are the two poems of Herbert's called Jordan. And, and we conventionally number them Jordan 1 and Jordan 2. Herbert doesn't actually do that. They're just both called Jordan. And one thing we certainly can talk about on Thursday is why those poems are called Jordan, okay? Uh, one of them is on page 48 in the temple. The other is on page 49. Uh, and I would ask that you guys read those poems fairly closely so that we can discuss them on Thursday under, again, that heading of the question of style, which is also in Herbert a question of, let's just say, what words are worth speaking? Uh, <coughs> what utterance can possibly make a difference uh, in terms of the state of your soul, in terms of uh, uh, where you are with God, uh, so to speak? Uh, what words can possibly make a difference and what kind of expression can possibly help uh, with your own understanding, your own attempt, uh, if you're like Herbert, mind saturated with the Bible, your own attempt to get from that Red Sea of despair to uh, the Canaan of uh, joy or at least maybe peace, relief, satisfaction, a moment of understanding. And understanding in Herbert, that moment where we get it a bit, that, I think, is really uh, the goal. Uh, even though uh, it is only ever, I think, glimpsed in Herbert's poetry. Okay, to wrap up this lecture, I want then to cut to uh, the end, so to speak, where Herbert does give us a couple of poems which are really pretty darn good and which goes some way toward making uh, things uh, understandable and uh, bearable for us. Uh, and the first one is going to be his fifth poem numbered, Affliction. Uh, but once again, I have managed to leave the page number out of my notes, so forgive me for hunting and pecking for a moment. You guys can just fast forward through this part. apologize profusely for this uh, lack of organization on my part. Um, okay. so I'm going to have to go back to the module and find the page. Okay, it's on page 89. Sorry about that. On page 89 uh, in uh, the temple. Okay. Uh, just a couple more of these, and then we'll wrap up this lecture. Um, this poem, Affliction, uh, it's the fifth poem in the temple called Affliction, so we normally call it Affliction number five. Um, Herbert addresses God. He says, My God, I read this day that planted paradise was not so firm as was and is thy floating ark, whose stay and anchor thou art only to confirm and strengthen it in every age when waves do rise and tempests rage. A beautiful, somewhat difficult uh, stanza uh, where Herbert is basically saying the church, thats he, he's using the ark as a metaphor for the church, the church is more stable uh, than paradise was because the church, the, the church, the ark, floats on top uh, of those waters uh, and uh, its stay and anchor is God himself. So the church just gets stronger and stronger in every age. Uh, we begin 
this poem then affliction number five in a very very sunday schooly mode and that's the mode that herbert stays in for the the first part of the poem he says at first we lived in pleasure so in paradise at first we lived in pleasure, thine own delights thou didst to us impart. When we grew wanton, wanton means naughty, when we grew wanton, thou didst use displeasure to make us thine. Yet, th yet that we might not part, as we at first did board with thee, now thou wouldst taste our misery. So another difficult kind of uh, summary uh, I mean, making a summary, a uh, theological stanza, little story, a, a one stanza version of the Christian story. Uh, at first, we lived in pleasure when we were in paradise, in Gen Genesis 1 through 3. But then we were naughty, the fall and all that stuff. So what did you do, God? Well, you used displeasure to make us belong to you. You gave us pain and suffering. Thanks, man. Uh, when we grew wanton, thou didst use displeasure to make us not thine. Yet that we might not part, as we at first did board with thee, now thou wouldst taste our misery. In, or, in other words, you incarnated yourself as, as Christ to come down and, you know, participate in, in, in pain and suffering with us. Sounds great so far. Uh, third stanza, Herbert says, There is but joy and grief. If either will convert us, we are thine. Uh, some angels use the first. If our relief take up the second, then thy double line and several baits in either kind furnish thy table to thy mind. Um, Herbert's using and deploying here a, a very, very ancient uh, Christian symbol. It goes back to the Gospels. Uh, which is the symbol of, of, of Christ as a fisherman. And of course, Christ in the Gospels is associated with fishermen. Most of his first uh, disciples are, are fishermen. Um, and, uh, but in Herbert's, again, Sunday schooly treatment of that image, uh, he gives us God fishing with, with, with two baits, baits in either kind, joy and grief, whoosh, whoosh, furnishing his table uh, to his mind. So uh, it is a very difficult, let's say, image uh, that Herbert develops out of that uh, uh, classic one of Christ as a fisher of men. Um, in, in Herbert's version, it's God fishing with joy and getting joyful fish, fishing with grief and getting uh, griefful fish. And those are both us squirming on that plate. Uh, but that's the way God likes it. Some joy and some grief. Um, so the point I'm trying to make about this incredible poem, Affliction 5, is Herbert, again, uses and deploys that Sunday schooly stuff with a very kind of straight face, um, as though in order to, to give us uh, a dish, a plate full of doctrine that we are supposed to like, uh, which is the doctrine uh, that, you know, if we suffer, uh, if we have grief, that's great. Because that's another way for us to belong to God. There is but joy and grief. If either can convert us, we are thine. Uh, a very, very difficult dish for us to eat, I think. And that's the point. But then what Herbert does from exactly that moment in this incredible poem, I think is really very remarkable. For me, at least, what he does is he manages to take this unbearable and intolerable Sunday schooly um, repetition of the doctrine of patience. You know, if you're suffering, that's great. That's God's design for you. 
And, and God likes it that way, and you just have to accept that. It's like the water course, right? Just turn the course. And, and accept that tears are yours, suffering is yours, strife is yours, damnation is yours. Herbert goes from that, which I think none of us uh, can sincerely sign up for, to this third and last stanza and this incredible line and image, which is certainly one of my favorites uh, in all po poetry of the 17th century or any other century. Herbert says, affliction then is ours. We are the trees whom shaking fastens more while blustering winds destroy the wanton bowers and ruffle all their curious knots and store. Affliction then is ours, okay. We suffer. It's Red Sea of Despair stuff, our life. It's not tasty grapes in the promised land stuff. Affliction then is ours. And um, it is certainly not accidental that Herbert wrote five poems called Affliction. Like very many people in the 17th century, he was sick basically all the time, and then he died around the age of 40. Unacceptable, right? And yet, what he does here in a way that I think is very remarkable and truly moving is he makes an incredible attempt through his gifts as a poet to make the unacceptable acceptable, to make the unintelligible intelligible, if only for a moment, uh, through that line, that image, we are the trees whom shaking fastens more. Incredible line. I mean, it means, uh, you know, we, we get stronger through suffering or whatever doesn't kill us, make us stronger or whatever. And yet it doesn't mean that. It means much more than that, precisely through the incredible poetic expression, the incredible image, the incredible uh, rhythmic execution uh, that Herbert has given that thought. That's a thought. So if somebody comes to you and says, well, whatever doesn't kill you, make you stronger, uh, you know, you want to give them a smack. Uh, Herbert comes to you and says, we are the trees whom shaking fastens more. And you come, I think, to a, a kind of incredible moment of conclusion and satisfaction at the end of that line. It is as though, again, it is as though for a moment it seems possible to accept uh, the doctrine uh, that Herbert is trying to accept and help us to accept, which is the doctrine of suffering, that the suffering is just uh, part of our lives and part of our uh, fate, up to and including that horrible, horrendous early modern Protestant vision in which we may be destined to suffer uh, infinitely for all time if, in fact, we are among the damned. You can't possibly accept that. But maybe for one tiny, tiny moment at the end of, of that incredible line with George Herbert, you see and hear how it might make some kind of sense. Uh, okay. Um, I am going to wrap up there, uh, I think. Um, on Thursday, I do very much want to return to that question of style in Herbert. Uh, and uh, that's going to involve those two poems called Jordan. It's also going to involve a couple of other poems that I, that I, uh, that I uh, asked you guys to read in this selection that I specified for this week. One of them, I mean, they're both, and they're both very late poems uh, in the temple. One of, them, one of them is a poem called Discipline. The other is a poem called The Forerunners. Uh, so please do have a look at those. Um, I want to wrap up this lecture uh, with a kind of a coda uh, reaching back to the beginning, which itself, of course, reached back to the beginning of the course uh, and the heavily biblical context for a lot of advanced natural, philosophical, and scientific thinkers uh, in the early modern period. And we can, we can, uh, we can think of our old friend uh, John Wilkins one more time on that point. Wilkins certainly has his mind filled with the Bible, and he talks about it a lot. Uh, but there is something, I think, uh, 
kind of obvious and yet worth noticing about the way in which Wilkins talks about the Bible, the way in which the Bible, for somebody like John Wilkins, seems to function as a text that points in a kind of progressive intellectual or natural philosophical direction. Surprisingly for Wilkins, uh, the Bible, insofar as it is productive and useful for him, it's really the Old Testament uh, that he talks about, and primarily even the book of Genesis that he talks about, including the specific stories from Genesis that we looked at uh, together over the last uh, couple of weeks. So, and, and indeed the book of Genesis in the early modern period, it had the status of a kind of sacred book of natural philosophy. Um, the world as mapped out by God, something uh, like that. So uh, when we're looking at a guy like John Wilkins, we're looking at a mind that is certainly saturated with the Old Testament and saturated with Genesis, and it's very useful for the thinking that he wants to do about the nature of language, for example, out of Genesis 11. I don't think necessarily when we're looking at a guy like John Wilkins, we're looking at a mind that is saturated with the New Testament, at least not as much. That does not seem to be as useful for him. Uh, Herbert is a mind saturated with, obsessed with uh, the New Testament, and it leads him into these very, very difficult meditations, as we have seen, not about you know science or the world or anything like that, but about much more uh, traditional core religious concerns about theology, about salvation, about suffering, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to stop this lecture there, and we'll talk more about Herbert on Thursday. Thank you very much.